Vought SB2 Vindicator was an aircraft that represented the beginning of both a major shift in American naval aircraft design and naval bombing tactics. In World War I, aircraft were limited in their ability to strike naval targets due to their relatively short range. The majority of naval attacks were done by seaplanes or some sort of airship or blimp. Torpedoes had been seen as a major weapon for the naval aircraft, but bombing was also being looked at. Some light bombing work had been done by more conventional aircraft, and it soon became apparent that dive bombing tactics would greatly increase the accuracy against moving targets, such as ships. The technology and primitive design of airframes immediately post-World War I and during the 1920s prevented the design of an absolute dive bomber. The airframes just couldn't take the physical and aerodynamic pressures. But by the 1930s, things were changing. In 1934, the United States Navy issued a requirement for a new scout bomber for carrier use, and they received proposals from six different manufacturers. The specification was issued in two parts, one for a monoplane and one for a biplane. Vought submitted designs in both categories, which would become the XSB2U1 and XSB3U1 respectively. Navies the world over were infected with admirals of highly reluctant natures who viewed any innovations with suspicion, and the US Navy was not exempt from this, and the biplane was considered alongside the monoplane design more as a compromise rather than a completely serious suggestion. Vought's entry featured a number of innovative ideas as well as a number of features carried over from the earlier biplane, the SBU-1. It was a conventional, low-wing monoplane configuration with a retractable landing gear, the pilot and tail gunner being seated in tandem under a long birdcage-style canopy. Typical of US aircraft development at the time, the construction was a blend of the old and the new. The fuselage was of a steel tube construction, covered with aluminium panels from the nose to the rear cockpit, and then with fabric coverings for the rear of the fuselage. It featured folding wings to decrease the space required when used aboard aircraft carriers, but the wings were also mostly fabric, except for a metal leading edge. The prototype was powered by a 700 horsepower Pratt & Whitney R15-35-78 14-cylinder air-cooled radial engine, which drove a two-blade Hamilton standard constant speed propeller. This propeller was reversible and intended to act as an air brake during dive bombing attacks. In this dive bombing role, the Vindicator carried a single 1,000 pound bomb on its underbelly, which was released by using a swinging trapeze in order to fall clear of the propeller in a dive. The wings were sturdy enough to accommodate four racks to carry smaller bombs for a maximum bombing payload of 1,500 pounds. The SB2U was evaluated against the Brewster XSBA1, the Curtis XSBC3, the Great Lakes XB2G1, the Grumman XSBF-1, and Northrop's XBT-1. Of the monoplane competitors, the Navy actually accepted all but a submission by Hull, which was the XPT-BH-1, for fleet service. The Douglas XTBD-1 became the TBD-1, and the Brewster XSBA-1, the only mid-wing monoplane submitted, went into production as the SBN-1. The Northrop XPT-1 had been entered in the competition as a combination dive bomber and scout aircraft, and the Navy decided to develop the design as a dive bomber as well, which would go on to become the SBD Dauntless. One prototype of the SB-2U was ordered in October of 1934, flying for the first time on January 4th, 1935 at Rentschler Field in Connecticut. After a series of manufacturer's trials, the aircraft was delivered to the Navy in July 1936 for further testing. The Navy tests uncovered a technical problem with the aircraft's dive bombing capabilities. The reversible propeller, which was meant to act as an air brake, proved difficult to use and actually risked causing damage to the engine. As a replacement, a dive flap was constructed consisting of a number of finger-like spars that were mounted near the wing leading edges. During normal flight, these would be flush against the wing surface, but during a dive they would be extended at right angles to slow down the aircraft. Unfortunately, this solution proved to be too effective, causing so much drag that full engine power was required to maintain control during the dive, and this idea was soon also abandoned. Vought then tried using a system of extendable flaps, but these had structural weaknesses at speed, causing alarming aileron buffeting during normal flight, and added an unacceptable amount of weight to the airframe. Eventually, it was decided that no innovative solution would work without a major redesign of the airframe. 
Instead, it was decided that the SB-2U would attack from a shallower dive angle, using its landing gear as an impromptu air brake, with the pilots quietly praying that it didn't rip off during the attack. Eventually, the aircraft completed all of the necessary Navy trials, and an order of 56 SB-2U-1s was placed in October of 1936. This first production batch of aircraft was almost identical to the prototype, the only major changes being some additional strengthening of struts in the pilot's and gunner's cockpits, and the installation of the newer R-15 3596 engine, taking the power up from 750 horsepower to 825 horsepower. The first aircraft to enter service joined VB-3 aboard the aircraft carrier Saratoga, replacing the outdated Curtis BFC-2 biplanes. Soon after that, the aircraft carriers Lexington, Ranger, and Wasp would also receive their complement of Vindicator dive bombers, and they would become a familiar sight during naval exercises in the years leading up to America's entry into World War II. The SB-2U-2 series soon began rolling off the production line, with 58 being built. It was pretty much the same as the previous version, almost identical in weight and flight performance, but with some upgraded equipment in the cockpit. This model of the aircraft would serve as the basis for export models that would be delivered to France in 1939, designated the V-156. The French incorporated their own equipment to the aircraft, and aircrews were trained for carry operations aboard the Bayonne. The old aircraft carrier would be deemed too slow for operational service, however, and the aircraft would be transferred to mainland units during the Battle of France. They would be used to strike advancing German ground units, particularly vital bridgeheads, and they would also participate during the evacuation at Dunkirk. Following the defeat of France, planned deliveries to the French were taken over by the British, and the aircraft were assigned to the fleet air arm. The aircraft was named the Chesapeake by the British, though many of their airmen preferred the nickname Cheesecake. Several modifications to the aircraft were made, including upgraded armour to protect the pilot, new radios, four forward-firing machine guns, and the additional fuel tank that was now being fitted to the SB-2U-3 variants. Back over in America, this new variant of the aircraft boasted a more efficient engine, improved armour protection for the crew, and the addition of two 50 caliber machine guns. It was intended as a long-range scout bomber, which could be fitted with either a conventional wheeled undercarriage or a pair of floats for maritime operations. To give it the required range, internal fuel tanks had been added into the wings, and the tail had been increased in span to accommodate a larger rear fuel tank. This version of the aircraft first flew in February of 1939, and was successfully tested as both a land plane and a float plane, with an order of 57 units being placed in September of 1939. By 1939, the US Navy was beginning to replace some of its older Vindicators for newer, more powerful dive bombers, and like all obsolete equipment that still had a shred of usefulness, it was decided to assign them to the Marine Corps, who received the bulk of the SB-2U-3 deliveries. It was around this time that the aircraft finally got its name, having previously only been referred to by its designation of SB-2U. When America entered the war after the attack on Pearl Harbor, the Vindicator was becoming increasingly obsolete, it being the penultimate design from the age when fabric-covered trust aircraft were the norm. For various reasons, the carrier-based Vindicators would not see combat in the Pacific. In April of 1942, the USS Wasp would join Force W to deliver vital military equipment to the island of Malta. As a result of this, she would not be carrying her Vindicators with her. USS Ranger was now deemed too small for the Pacific and would spend her time in the Atlantic, her Vindicators briefly providing convoy escort until mid-1942 when they would be replaced. By year's end, most of the carrier base Vindicators were being replaced or had already been replaced by the SBD Dauntless. Land-based Vindicators did see some combat, aside from being glorified target practice during the attack on Pearl Harbor. Vindicators operated by the US Marine Corps saw action during the Battle of Midway, nearly seven years after the aircraft had first entered service. By this point, the aircraft did not have a fond reputation with USMC pilots, who liked to call them wind indicators due to their poor speed. As expected of an airframe so obsolete, the Vindicators took heavy losses during the battle. The squadron held at Midway, designated VNSB-241, had 12 Vindicators in its complement, of those 12, 6 were lost during the battle, and 5 more were damaged beyond operational limits. During the opening phases of the battle, the SB-2Us would join the SBDs under Major Norris during their attack on the Japanese carrier Hiryu. 
they would suffer heavy losses to the patrolling Zeros that protected the enemy fleet. On that day, two Vindicators failed to return to Midway for reasons unknown, most likely lost in action, and another two were forced to ditch en route back to Midway due to either damage or running out of fuel. On the 5th of June, the remaining Vindicators took off to join SPDs that were tasked with attacking the heavy cruisers Mikuma and Megami. Captain Richard E. Fleming, whose SPD was too badly damaged the previous day, would fly one of the Vindicators into battle. During the first moments of the attack, Fleming's aircraft was hit and immediately took fire. Despite this, he pressed on with his bombing run against the Mikuma. He would just miss with his bombs and his aircraft was seen crashing into the sea in flames. Combined with his actions from the previous day, he would posthumously become the first Marine Corps pilot to receive the Medal of Honor during World War II. The remaining SB2Us would be reorganized after Midway, and stayed on the island until March of 1943. After that, they would be rotated back to Hawaii. Marine Corps squadrons were now being equipped with the TBF-1s, and the remaining inventory of Vindicators were sent to various training units throughout the United States. Only one example of the aircraft survives today, number 1383, which had originally been lost during a landing accident on the training aircraft carrier Wolverine over Lake Michigan. The plane had sunk to the bottom of the lake, but it was recovered in 1990 and after a long restoration can now be found on display at the National Navy Aviation Museum in Pensacola, Florida.